Daisy. That's me. Dean Walker, please sit. My assistant says that you are interested in resuming med school. That's right. May I ask what prompted your desire to get back to your studies? I guess I couldn't stop thinking about my time here. Yeah, that's an extraordinary place. It's an unusual request. Yes, but I left under unusual circumstances. Oh. I left because of what happened to Nina. Hmm. Nina Fisher. You don't remember her? Maybe you remember Alexander Monroe? Oh, yes, Alexander Monroe. He actually just came back and gave a talk here. Oh, he's a, he's a really nice guy, really smart. Are you a friend of his? No. So you don't remember the accusations made against Al Monroe? I don't. He took a girl, Nina Fisher, the one you don't remember, back to his room where he had sex with her repeatedly and in front of his friends while she was too drunk to have any idea what was going on. She was covered in bruises the next day. Handprints, I guess you could say. Was it reported? Yes. Do you know who Nina spoke to? You. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Killer Casting. I'm Lisa Zambetti, and I'm probably best known for my work casting CBS's Criminal Minds, where I've cast killers and stalkers and rapists. And apropos of the film we're going to cover today, I've cast probably the worst kind of predator, the nice guy. And you know that guy. He's unassuming. He's approachable. He's maybe a little dorky, completely non-threatening. He says all the right things. He's got the right job. He's got the right family. But as my Dear colleagues on Real Crime Profile would say, he's a charm and harm guy. He's the guy who can turn from a dreamy prince into your worst nightmare. And I have cast all kinds of victims of crimes from every walk of life, every ethnicity, victims who are stalked and raped and murdered. But I think I can say with utmost confidence, I've never cast a character quite like Cassie. This is the role that Carrie Mulligan plays in the extraordinary and very controversial film, Promising Young Woman. And that is what we're going to talk about today. But I do have a trigger warning because this film is extremely disturbing in many ways, both explicitly and implicitly. And it goes deep into the subject of sexual assault and self-harm. And we're going to be discussing those things. And it can be very upsetting for people. And I want you to be okay. So please take good care of yourself. Okay. Here we go. With me today is my ever-present sexy beast, the wonder from down under. Say hello to Dean Laffin. Thank you, Lisa. Great to be here. And uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in once again to another rep. And Dean, you just told me that you waited until just before recording to watch the end of Promising Young Woman, right? <sighs> I made the fateful decision to watch it in two parts. The first half Roughly, I just stopped at roughly halfway. And then I thought, I'll watch the second half right before the pod so it's all fresh in my mind and I'll be able to speak with it all in a recent memory. And boy, was that a bad decision. I It's early morning here. I was sitting in my lounge room. I started in the dark. It was that early and with the headphones on. So it was particularly sort of encompassing. And by the time the titles rolled, I was just fucking devastated i did not know what to think what to th i was just i just sat in the chair for minutes just going oh my god for all sorts of good and bad reasons we will be spoiling the end of the film at the end of this podcast but we're gonna we're gonna go in kind of in chunks but listen when i saw the trailer of promising a woman there was only two people i thought of right off the jump those are my beloved co-hosts on Real Crime Profile. I knew I could not tackle this film without getting their input to talk about its significance. So with me today is... Hi, I'm Jim Clementi, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer-producer of CBS's Criminal Minds. 
and a fucking badass and a hero <laughs> and one of my <laughs> favorite people that. in the world. A longtime fan, Jim, uh, first time caller here uh, yeah. from my part as well. Yeah, Jim, I you may not work. realize this, yeah, but good. Dean has been listening to Real Crime Profile from the beginning. And that's how we wow, that's connected awesome. and met. And he has been just a real wingman for me on a lot of our book club things. And he's just always whispering wow. in my ear, Lisa, you should do this case. You should do that case. We do wish that Laura could be here. I I thought she was going to be logging on. Maybe she'll log on late. But um, it, this, She's I, in the yeah. middle of all sorts of legislative moves yeah, right, right now. So that's probably what took her away. Laura is saving uh, the world I'm sure she one she could be here. offender at a time. <laughs> but um, yes, but we're going to jump into it. And so I'm going to ask you so many questions, Jim. I, I hardly know where to, spot, to start, but we're going to. So a traditional movie and TV episode is written kind of in three acts. Would you would you say basically three acts, Jim? Uh, movie is. Yeah. TV yeah. shows are written because of commercials in four, five, six acts. Oh, okay. But movies are written in three acts. So Emerald Fennell wrote this movie deliberately in five acts, and that's very Shakespearean structure. So what I'd love to do is kind of go act by act, and I want to get your reaction kind of to each act of it. And there's so much, you know, Jim knows my uh, wardrobe and wallpaper trigger was off the fucking charts in this film. I have so much to say about it. <laughs> but about an hour 40 into the movie, I wanted to pick up my computer and throw it out the window. I was so angry. And I've I've had to kind of reckon with that for a while and um, really read more about what Emerald Fennell says about why she did the ending she did. And I want to ask you about that. But anyway, so Jim, I want you to just talk about the, the opening scene. It's a cold scene, a, a cold open scene where we're in a club with a bunch of like Wall Street douchebags or whatever. I know these guys well. I'm sure you do too because I worked on Wall Street with their chinos and yeah. their whatever so Armani sh shirts. Um, and they're like partying. And what do we see in the scene? You see a vulnerable woman on a bench uh, in the place and she's clearly not in control of herself. Um, looks like she's wasted and... The first reaction of the guys is very disgusting, and it blames it blames her and then her as a representative of all women who dare to go to a club and get drunk, which is exactly what these guys are doing, by the way. But if women dare to do it, it's their own fault, whatever happens to them. That's the message these guys are conveying. Yeah, and they're making fun of her age. I mean, they're just raking her over the coals. But then one of the nice guys in the group, what does he do? He approaches her and he says he wants to take care of her. And uh, she uh, says she'll just uh, drive home or get herself home. And he says, no, let me take you. Uh, you know, that's just that's on my way. And yeah. then, of course, he ends up bringing her to his place mm -hmm. and she's you know still almost i mean on the on the verge of unconsciousness and uh out of control she cannot actually function but he still wants her to drink more right. he pours a glass that's three times as tall as his yep and so it's clear what his intentions are and then he starts to undress her and sexually assault her. And yeah. she's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, no. And then there's the first turn yeah. in the show. And she literally sits up and says, I said, what are you doing? And he realizes for the first time that she's actually totally in control of herself. She's not wasted. And she's pissed off. Yeah. So he thought he was going to get a free ride to take advantage and sexually assault and or rape her. And instead, he gets her very, very real, very aggressive self, uh, putting him in a very difficult position. And Dean, do you remember what he's saying as he's kind of kissing her and getting ready to go down on her? Do you remember what he says? No, I've forgotten. Oh, uh, it's okay. Oh, he's, it's okay. he's saying, you're, is that what safe. he's saying? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, yes. Oh, Same God, it was sickening. It's, and I'm wondering, Jim, 
does he think that like it's okay if he does this like some other guy would like take advantage of her but but he's like a nice <laughs> he's guy. a nice guy <laughs> yeah that's what we call rationalization okay he is saving her from these bad people that could take advantage of her but he's saving her for himself he's mm-hmm. saving her so he can take advantage of her and he rationalizes that it's okay because he's not beating her he's not pulling a gun or a knife on her and he is not forcing himself on her and i'm using those air quotes when i say that when in fact that's exactly what he's doing because when a person whether it's male or female or anything in between does not have their physical um, and mental capabilities about them and you engage in sexual activity with them you are doing it without their consent that is legally a sexual assault or rape. It is yes. not consensual. Exactly. That's the important thing. And she was doing this, this character Cassie was doing this to point that out. And when you see her little book where she has dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of lines, and then she'll do four lines and then the fifth line crossing. So she's been doing this for quite a while, apparently. Yeah, it's like a kill book. And We don't know if it's a kill book or not. Yeah. I think the director wants us to assume that this is like every other. Uh, Okay. But what I'm saying is that what we have is her book is filled with red lines and black lines. Mm -hmm. I think the red lines are kills and I think the black lines survive. And I believe he survived because later they one of his friends actually says, oh, you're the crazy person that that did this to so and so. Right. So I think he survived and told his friends about it. Um, I think she killed some people. It was implied that she killed some people. Yeah. And I think it was implied that she let others go. For example. Interesting. So I thought it was. I don't know where this is in your act structure, but as time went on, there's another guy and another setup exactly the same way. And he's taking advantage of her. And she does not give consent because she's incapable of it because of her condition. And he wakes her up to then get involved with her sexually. And so I think she gives him points for that. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, he basically gets to survive. He gets, he gets a black check Mark or a black strike in the book. I'm so taken. I'm so taken that that's, I think however you took that is completely, Valid, Jim and Dean. I don't know if you did. Maybe that's it's so funny that you would say that. I know, but we're going to get to this. So let's just see what unfolds. I just want to mention that after (laughs) that first interaction where we first meet her and she does or she doesn't, you know, it seems like they're indicating she killed Adam Brody, but and she puts a tally mark and you see her then with her parents. Okay, so she's a grown ass woman, but clearly she's living with her parents. And Jim, this is where my crazy meter went off because. Everything in the house has got a rose pink glow. Everything, you know, everybody's wearing like a pink um, bathrobe. The walls are slightly pink. The just so much pink. It's just so funny. And everything in the house is breakable. Like the fruit on the parents' breakfast table, it's all porcelain. And everything behind, every shot you see, everything behind her is like there's a porcelain doll, there's a porcelain swan. I thought everything in that house was actually overly gilded and baroque Mm -hmm. and just the kind of thing where you'd have plastic covers on the cushions in the living room and and basically you're not allowed to live there you're not allowed to experience life here this is sort of like you know the showroom and so that's how she grew up apparently and i saw her mother as as a caricature basically who did not value her daughter's life unless she was attached to a man and a successful man. And her father, though, was more of a, let's just let things happen as they do. And he was sort of a marshmallow compared to the mother. Yeah, there's a lot of tension in that scene, right, Dean? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you clocked it as well, but when, so when they surprise her, 
about when they surprise her, when they, they bring up the fact that it's her 30th birthday and she acts surprised like she didn't know whether she did or didn't. And then she leaves the house and they're watching TV. Did you see what was on the TV when they when she left? It was some Robert, Robert Mitchum black and white movie. I didn't know what it was. Black and white, Robert Mitchum, Night of the Hunter, which is one of the most disturbing, psychotic films you would ever see about him as a child murderer. Um, directed by Charles Lawton, the only film that Charles Lawton ever directed. But anyway, but to your point about the uh, the styling of it, I read an interview where she had a mood board that she was using for the film, and she had things like To Die For, mm-hmm. so she had shots from To Die For, the Nicole Kidman mm-hmm. 90s film. She had Psycho, amongst all things, and then a thing that I had to Google, and it was called Sweet Valley High. She had a ton of stuff from Sweet Valley High. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. When I checked it and then hit images, the screen just filled with all this pink and white. It was like marshmallow colors and it was all this 90s-esque, you know, kind of... I don't um, remember living in super. pink and marshmallow when I was in the 90s, but <laughs> no, you know, know. that's what somebody thinks. This is thinks. a very certain uh, girl uh, POV, I think. But yeah, you're right. And Jim, yeah. I'm sure you probably notice this because I make you notice this but um, through these very many scenes until the second act of the movie she's in different versions of pink she's in a pink sweater Mm. she's got pink roses she's pink 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 and for me it's two things it's it shows her kind of arrested development like she's not Mm. I don't know she's still kind of stuck in that world of when she was she and her girlfriends you know when her girlfriend her little best friend was alive and also it makes her look very unthreatening somebody can Mm. approach her but uh, i don't know i I thought it was just very interesting Mm. there's a very specific color palette to what she wears and later on her color palette changes more towards blue but anyway i wouldn't say kind of stuck i would say she's absolutely stuck isn't she she's 30 years old she's living with her parents in she's almost infantilized right because she's frozen from that period of time where the trauma happened. This is like if I had to pick one word about this film, I would say trauma. It is a study of someone, a deeply, deeply affected, damaged person, right? She's just got no life. So, Jim, what did you think of watching this character who is clearly in this sort of feedback loop of she's not moving forward with her life? She's stuck in this sort of revenge fantasy world and she can't. It's all that she really cares about. I mean, does that feel true to you for people? And at this point, we don't know why. We can imply that maybe she experienced this some kind of direct trauma with men, that she was a victim of some sort of date it rape very much or is implied. some kind of assault. Yeah, it's very much implied through most of the film that, you know, she was the victim, that something bad happened that caused her to leave school. We don't know what it is, but we can guess. And based on the fact that we see her playing this recurring role, we don't know whether she's actually reliving what had happened to her or not. And it appears that way, though we just don't know. It's not confirmed in any way. And some of that, there are people who are survivors of trauma who basically live in a victim status the rest of their time. And that's sad. And it usually means that they have not actually emotionally and mentally addressed the issues uh, that trauma can cause. It is also very clear that they're implying that she's a serial killer. And I don't care what the motivation is. If you kill multiple people, you're a serial killer, period. And so there's a very distasteful thing in the back of my mind growing as I'm getting to know this character, and that is that sort of justification or rationalization. Well, I'm doing it for the right reason because these are bad people. And to me, she's still a serial killer. And so I wasn't sure what the situation was. But as time went on, I think that became more and more clear. And I do feel like she felt the necessity to take this into her own hands because the powers that be did not address the sexual assaults slash rapes that were actually apparently happening all the time. And the insidious nature of this type of crime, the crimes that she is addressing, not the crimes that she is committing, but the insidious nature of them is that when you take advantage of somebody who is not in control of their own faculties, who may have been drugged into amnesia and inaction, or may have just decided to get drunk themselves or high themselves and... and 
So you just hold the phone, everybody. Stop the presses. Laura is here. She's jumping on. I'm so glad that she was able to jump on. Please say hello. And Laura, uh, please introduce yourself to those who don't know you. Hi there, everyone. My name's Laura Richards. I'm a criminal behavioral analyst and former New Scotland Yard and host of Real Crime Profile, which this is kind of like a real crime profile gone killer casting and also host of Crime Analyst. So I'm really pleased to be here. It's great to see you. I was I was telling. Hey there, Jim. I was telling them, Laura, that when I saw this trailer of the movie, I thought I have to talk about it with you and Jim. And so I'm so glad you're here. And already Jim's perspective is so very interesting and very different from mine. And so I'm very interested to hear, you know, what you have to say. We've gotten to the part where we're kind of taking it in chunks um, and we'll spoil the end, but not until the end. And we've sort of just talked about the, the beginning scenes, you know, right up until she meets the guy who's going to become her boyfriend. And I especially, I just want to talk to you just about the very beginning, the beginning of especially there's a scene with some construction workers, just your impression as you were watching from the beginning, anything you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, for me, this is everyday life for a woman and this is my lived in experience that I'm seeing on a screen of I, I actually liked the flip of the script though the start is all men dancing in a club normally you see women dancing in the scantily clad you know home, honing in on women's bodily parts and I actually quite enjoyed the whole chino and shirt and men in all their different shapes and sizes and it made me very curious right from the start where's this going what, what's this about um, and then you get all the everyday sexism chat, the misogyny, the way women are spoken about in bars. And so immediately I was very interested in it. And I think it continued in that theme, although I was curious about her and what we were going to see from her. And of course, we saw the switch of that she wasn't drunk. And uh, then she piqued my interest of what was her backstory and knowing that, you know, was she some kind of avenging angel? Was she taking revenge for something that had happened. And I really wanted to know what that backstory was, knowing it would probably be some form of trauma. So I think they did all of that incredibly well, down to walking past building sites. When I was last in London, I had exactly the same situation multiple times. We call it street harassment that women and girls just deal with every day. And for most men, that would probably surprise them. But it is lived in experience. And this is exactly what women encounter every day and it's it was very well done I thought even to the music it's raining men I loved the soundtrack and I was all in right from the start of wanting to know where it was going to go I loved in that scene with the construction workers Laura I, every woman has had this experience I don't think and it's such a trope to be catcalled but all she has to do is stare at them and suddenly there's this reversal where they're like oh stop staring at us you're crazy bitch you know and then they walk away it's just so interesting that she doesn't have to say you're a dick or she doesn't have to do anything just look at them i thought that was such a powerful moment it told me right away that this movie is going to kind of really reverse a lot of expectations yeah absolutely and i i think the way that she re responds you know, most women, you feel slightly embarrassed. You don't know whether to make eye contact. You don't know whether to tell them to go F themselves. You know, if you probably say something like that, you're going to get it worse. And so you're in a very uncomfortable situation. And she just stares them down and reduces them. And because she doesn't behave in the way that they want, then she gets the insults. And again, that's classic behavior that women have to deal with. And I had the same conversation with Umberto as we were walking up to, to Venice the other day, where a man got very uh, angry. We were just walking past him doing our cardio. And I said to Umbe, if I was on my own, I would have felt very threatened by him. And then you see UNT, all this other stuff that he started to say just for walking down the street. To be honest, I'm just so sick of it. You know, and you feel slightly more protected when you've got a man with you. But why should you have to deal with right. that? Why should you have to put up with it? But we do because there's no other option. And you try and be polite and f navigate your way through it. And I think, you know, for the men, no man has ever married the woman who he's catcalled off of a building site. It never would happen. So check yourselves. <laughs> no one's interested in that behavior. And again, it's not all men. I'm just saying that because there'll be someone there saying, oh, it's no, all, we're not course. saying it's yes. all men, but the men who do it. 
Uh, most often it's intimidating actually to women. There's nothing flattering about it at all. No, it changes your behavior. You start walking down the street, like covering your breasts or something. Anyway, Jim, sorry. No, I just was saying, I, I was commenting on the fact that when I saw her with her book and she was putting those marks in it, I thought the red marks were guys that she killed and the black or blue marks were the ones that she let live. Um, and so I, I don't know what, what, if you want to comment on that, like that, because I had already said that. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure what the, the scoring out was. And I initially did think something very bad was ha- happening to them at her hand. And therefore, you start to become a bit conflicted at that moment. Well, what is it that she's doing? Is this Dexter-esque? And she's, you know, mm-hmm. and again, Dexter, the show should never really work. But then because of the morality of it and its bad people being... Uh, being brought to account and justice being dispensed, you kind of go on the side of that person. So I thought that was going to be quite a hard uh, line if that's where it was going to go. But I was very intrigued by it, of what they were trying to do. And certainly when I saw Margot Robbie was producing, um, to me, she was just like Margot Robbie, watching her on screen, I have to say. Um, So, yeah, very, very strong open, I felt. It completely had me locked into it and very curious. And I wrote copious amounts of notes. And I have to say, some of the scenes were really uncomfortable. And I've seen a lot of stuff across my career, but I was squirming and finding it very uncomfortable. Uh, But it's the reality of what we live. And I think the more men that can see that and really understand that that's what it's like for women navigating through the world every day, then the better. So we're just going to fast forward just a little bit to where we've got to. So after she... um... We, and you're right, we do think that she's probably killing these guys because we don't see the aftermath. But when she has the the date, quote unquote, date with the pretentious writer who is, you know, I, I'll talk about casting at, a, at a, another time about how the casting is absolutely weaponized in this show. But she after she leaves, you re, I realized and I think with the writer director intended is that she's not killing them but she's facing them off when they think that she's got her in a vulnerable position she's saying no i'm not drunk and you know what's my name what's this and that and she marks in her book and for me it was oh it's not a kill book it would be a kill book if this were a different writer and a different director then yeah this would be like kill bill she's going after getting her revenge in blood but that's that's not what the writer director is after here. She hasn't been turned into this monster. She hasn't been turned into a homicidal maniac. But for whatever reason, she's continuing to put herself in these dangerous positions. And we don't find out till much later why. We probably guess it's because she's been a victim of sexual violence herself. Emerald Fennell was saying, uh, she addressed that head on, saying that you know, we've seen lots of roles in films where men will take that marauding revenge kind of sort of role and that that's realistic, well, realistic in that it's common in film and it's somewhat more realistic in life. But she didn't want to go there with making it so overt that Cassie was, you know, this sort of revengeful killer because she said that's just not, it didn't ring true to her anyway. But just on the subject of that, do you know about her choice of the name for the character? I mean, I twigged that Cassandra is the nod to the Greek Cassandra of uttering prophecies but never to be believed. And Exactly, exactly. And so, Jim, you were saying before about, for example, I think you were just leading up to the scene where she goes to see Connie Britton, confronts her, the, the uh, dean, and she said, but we have to give these guys the benefit of the doubt. And so Cassandra, as Laura just said, she was cursed by Apollo. She was cursed and blessed, blessed with the ability to see the future, but cursed in that no one would ever believe her. And that's why she named her that, the, the name that she gave her. It's just a depressing. <laughs> I was like, Laura, I, I said to the guys earlier on, I only watched the second half of it right before the, sh- the show because I thought it would be good that it would be fresh in my mind. And I'm still getting myself together after the end of the movie. It, was just, it just floored me. 
Yeah, but I think it's most, I mean, her, the darkness that's within her is what I was curious about because you see she's not functioning on a day-to-day basis. She's not engaging with the rest of the world. Her parents are worried about her. So you want to know what the trauma was and how deep it is. And yes, the male lens would have been having her kill everybody and probably in a, with sexual aspects to it too. But I, I really like that scene with Connie Britton because that's what the experience is all the time for women, not being believed being discredited and giving the man the benefit of the doubt and the male narrative always being the most dominant and we mustn't ruin his reputation that's the experience of most domestic violence victims sexual violence victims that's what you're up against all the time and i thought they played that out really well the the drip 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 and then the role reversal it's all okay until it's your daughter or it's your you know, loved one. And then suddenly you see it in a totally different way. And of course, you start to see Connie Britton, Dean Walker flip out knowing that she's been told her daughter's in that bro culture, bro dorm, and now she's not confident that her own daughter would be okay. And it's a completely different reality. And you wonder how dark she is. Did she do that? Exactly. Did she set up Madison? You had a big reaction to that scene. Yeah, definitely. When when I thought that she set up Madison, this child, to be sexually assaulted or raped, that really got under my skin, obviously. But then, thankfully, she said, no, that didn't happen. But you now know I was right. And you don't have to give them the benefit of the doubt. In fact, in your mind, you're not giving them the benefit of the doubt, but you're just disbelieving me. You're disbelieving the victim to protect these guys that you know are doing these bad things. And if you did make an example of just one of them, it would dissuade all the other guys down the line. But by protecting him, you created an environment in which this is not only accepted, but it flourishes. And we all know that rapes on college campuses, date rapes, acquaintance rapes, on college campuses are rampant, rampant. And the only way to stop them is by, when you know it's happening, cold stop, absolutely not allowing it, not giving them the benefit of the doubt, not disbelieving the victim, but literally shining the brightest light on it you possibly can and then doing a thorough investigation and finding out what happened. But if somebody is a roommate and they knew it happened or something like that, or is a witness and they don't want to come forward, that person should have to leave the school because this is an environment that the deans and and security of that university have a responsibility to the people, the vulnerable people that are living there. And I believe it needs to be shut down immediately. I was just going to say, Connie Britton's dean, she has a line that struck me. She's like, do you know how many how many reports of this I get a week? As though, <laughs> the, you know, they're all bogus, that they're all fake. And I'm like, yeah, do you know how many you get a week? I mean, it was just, that's brilliant writing that you can see the irony of that line. The other line, Lisa, that just floored me was when, um, I can't remember which, I'm still too traumatized, which male character it was, said, do you you understand that this is a guy's worst nightmare? (laughs) Like being accused is the worst nightmare. It's like, oh. She said, and it very flatly. And can you guess what a woman's worst nightmare is? I thought the, um, what did you think about the title, Lisa? The Promising Young Woman, I, I, I took that a couple of different ways and it changed throughout the show. But first I thought it was kind of condescending that, oh, you know, she was a, oh, she's a promising young woman, you know, she's a medical school and all that. And then, of course, she really was a promising young woman and both of them were. And it sounds from her description that Nina was even, she was in awe of Nina and yet he, she herself was a, at medical school and going to be have a fantastic life. But it, we've spoken about gender flipping, but it, it's an inversion also, isn't it, of the common defence, Jim, as you talk about on college campuses. For example, Brock Turner case, that was his defence that... Well, he's a promising young man. You know, you shouldn't let this one mistake ruin his whole life. And in fact, no, it wasn't even, it wasn't even his defense, was it? It was the, it was the judge's comments at sentencing, if I'm not wrong, that he said, well, he's had a bit of a hiccup here, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's like, oh my God. He was a strong swimmer. That was, uh, (laughs) 
the issue. The <laughs> father go. had gone to the same university, the same college, and he was, you know, a very promising swimmer. But that happens every day, and that's what we battle against when I'm working cases. And if you, the dialogue actually was very strong, as Lisa said, even words like accusation that they had threaded in rather than allegations that are made and for her to say about the volume, like it's the victim's fault for, for reporting, it showed her she had major issues that she should have been dealing with but all swept and brushed under the carpet, which happened in Lauren McCluskey's case in Utah when she reported with her family and friends over 20 times abuse, rape, stalking, and they did nothing. So that's present day. That case happened um, two years ago, and the family have just received an apology and a $13 million payout from the university, and I've just been in teaching them. So, you know, it's not just what we see on screen. It really is, as Jim said, real life, and there's huge opportunities to educate and ensure that those leaders in those senior positions do something and don't just sweep it under the carpet. When it's revealed, I think it's revealed in that scene with the dean that it wasn't Cassie who was sexually assaulted. It was her dear friend, Nina. And I can just hear critics in my head saying, well, why would she do this over a friendship? Why can't she just get over it? And, you know, the writer director is saying, yes, sisterhood can be this strong. You can love somebody so much and have survivor's guilt. And then that turns and you're really harming yourself because you can't move on. I don't know if that struck either of you. Well, thanks. Well, you know, I thought, <clears throat> actually, I thought it made Cassie's character more heroic because she was doing it to address what happened to her best friend, Nina, who died by suicide. I think that really changed things a great deal for me in terms of who Cassie was. And she was so profoundly affected by what had happened to her best friend. And this is somebody she grew up with and was in her life, her whole childhood and young adult life. And so I saw her more like somebody who was trying to teach lessons and also trying to find some justice for her best friend who did not get any justice. And so, again, that conflict was still inside of me because I didn't know whether Cassie was going around killing people or not. But to the extent that she was trying to address this incredible wrong that happened and continued to happen, partially because the wrong was never addressed originally. In other words, it was, it was a metaphor for what happens, and it was literally what happens uh, which is when you let somebody get away with something, they keep getting away with it and nobody ever tries to stop it. It's horrible. Can I ask you both? We're just going to skip to her relationship with Ryan. She meets this guy and they fall for each other. She's a hard one to get, but she falls for him. And then she realizes that he was there at the the rape of her best friend and he was an onlooker. Is there any redemption for a guy like that? He, he didn't do anything at the time, and apparently he didn't speak out when Nina went to the authorities and tried to, you know, he was he wouldn't be a witness. Is there any way back from that, you know, now, many years later? I think he said, he's the one that said no one chooses to be put in a moral dilemma, but I would answer to that. But when you get there, you have a choice. In other words, you didn't choose to get there, but you're there, and now you have a choice of what you're going to do. And you have to, and the moral of this entire show, I think, was you have to stand up for those who need your help. You have an affirmative obligation to do it. Now, is there a redemption for this guy? Well, not at this time, because he didn't seem to actually live that I moved on. He was continuing to be friends with these guys. Had he said the first time she found out that he knew of these guys, had he said, oh, yeah, those guys are a bunch of assholes. I stay as far away from them as I can. Then I would say that guy has some redemption, some redeeming qualities. But no, he embraced them and continued to hang out with them, even though they were clearly in that same mindset when this stripper shows up at their cabin. So I don't believe there is any redeeming that character. It was sad because I really thought he was going to be that. But I think they 
depicted someone who we see all too often who goes along to get along and does not help somebody who is in dire need of his help. Thank you so much for Thank having so me. Much. I know, Jim. So great to meet you, Dean. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Laura. I'll talk to you later. Thank All you, right. Jim. Bye. I think that character, Ryan, the arc of that character within the film is really interesting. And even worse that Jim just said, well, he didn't stand up for it, at the t- didn't do anything at the time. It's worse than that because he presents as the ultimate nice guy. You think he really is a nice guy. But the most damning thing in this entire film, so when the detective approaches him and says, do you think she was capable of harming herself? And is a pause. And he knows that if he says yes, then they're going to close the case, probably. And he says yes. He throws her under the bus, like literally and figuratively. That was a disgusting, disgusting thing to say. And he did it. And he did it willingly. And it's like, okay, I'm done with you. Yeah. Laura, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, similarly, I think, you know, when you originally hear him challenge, he says, well, I was a kid. And then you can think to situations when you're younger and you make bad choices, bad decisions. But I don't think I'm a bad person. And of course, as Dean just said, the whole play with him is that he's safe. He is a doctor that works with children, safe, good guy. And that's the first thing he says, you know, I'm a nice guy. Don't think that I'm a bad guy. So we're having this constant dilemma of, who's good and who's bad. I'm a nice guy. That's what everybody says um, in throughout when they're challenged that they're nice. And then you have, as G- Dean said, the opportunity for him, and you see his dilemma in that moment, but he takes the easy way and he puts himself first over and above her, no matter what, that he knows that she has probably come to some harm, that she's disappeared, and yet he still chooses to allow the detective, and this happens in everyday life as well, the mental health card, the crazy woman, she'll harm herself, so she's discredited in those moments and the detective makes no attempt to ask the right questions. Well, if she's unstable or unhappy, what happened to her? No questions, no professional curiosity, just looking to write the case off, get it off his books, and the doctor, Ryan, is doing exactly the same, just wants the detective out of there as quickly as possible. So no redemption from me. He had opportunities to do the right thing. And had he have done those things in that moment, different story, but that's not what he did. Well, yeah, and in fact, by doing so, he ultimately comes down once again on the side of his bros. He's like, well, he's got to suspect, if not know, that they've killed her because she's missing And he decides, no, I'm going to protect them and myself. It's just mind-boggling. The other thing that I thought was a recurring theme was just how many of the guys that she met all begged for her forgiveness. The lawyer, when she goes to visit, Alfred Molina's character, literally throws himself at her feet begging for forgiveness. The guys all want her forgiveness for what they did. It's like, it's not her job. That's so annoying. It's just, it's disgusting. Well, I call that Dean poor me syndrome. At the point of accountability, poor me syndrome sets in because it's actually about them. It's not about having done the wrong thing. It's about being found out. And that's what she's trying to provoke. She's trying to provoke a shame response and hold them to account. So the whole, well, poor me, well, what's it like for me and my career? And I'm going to lose everything. And I think Ryan, that there was a moment where he said, I don't know if I can live with this hanging over me. And I just wrote down, imagine how it feels for a victim living like that for your, the whole of your life, unspoken words. And that they were just some very clever moments that told me that the writers, the director, they really understood trauma, sexual trauma, women's experiences, and how men, when they're called to account, most often, not all, but most often go into poor me syndrome, me, myself, and I, and that's all they're interested yeah. in. So let's talk about the ending. I just want to set it up for a second because I'm so curious about your response, Laura. You know, so we have this character who went from having these interactions with men that she's trying to shame for trying to have sex with a inebriated woman. And then she goes into this revenge mode of trying to kind of get back at the Dean and Alison Bree's character. And then with the revelation that her boyfriend, who she loves, was involved, I think that just pushes her to act and she goes for it. She dresses like a stripper in a nurse costume, which is so ironic given that she was on the medical track. And she goes almost like Little Red Riding Hood into the woods towards this cabin with this rager of a 
bachelor party. What were you thinking when she walked towards that cabin, Laura? Yeah, well, I, I think firstly, yes, Ryan, sorry, that pushed her over the edge, but actually watching the video, that would push her over the edge because I, I think they'd done quite a clever job of showing that everybody was saying to her, you must move on. You've got to get on with your life and you've got to put Nina behind you. That opens everything back up again. And even hearing it, I was very uncomfortable and I've seen those videos uh, just like it. And I think that opens her trauma all the way back up again and she goes into primary response, but she's planned premeditation. And for me, it was only ever going to end one way. A woman going in to challenge men like that about a secret that they've all been keeping, I didn't think it was going to end well. This is why I think it was quite a real ending, whereas the ending divided Umberto and I of whether it sh he wanted the Hollywood ending and I wanted the real ending. And I think a lot of people will be conflicted about it. But yes, what a very brave move, or perhaps it's a very reckless move, but you sense that she had some kind of backup plan that something else was going on in the background. But she seemed to have things under control to start with. But the reality is once you your trauma is very raw and it's unresolved, things do start to go wrong, no matter how well planned it is. And I think the irony that she's there, um, not I wouldn't say controlling them all, but the irony of sort of the sex aspect playing the key role of them all on their knees, the acts that she makes them do initially and getting them all inebriated. And then she goes up upstairs. It's all very carefully orchestrated, but I did get the sense it was probably not going to end well. Yeah. Well, they set up the whole movie with, you think she's about to commit an act of violence, that this time something violent is going to happen. And when it comes down to it, what she wanted was to carve Nina's name into his body. And you can see how that could be a great Hollywood ending. And uh, where he's then got to go to his wedding with fucking like Nina on his face and somehow have to explain that that would be a Hollywood ending where she's she survives and is the hero. But I hated that. Instead, she's um, things go wrong, and he gets free and um, smothers her to death. And, and Laura, what did you think about the time that they took with that smothering suffocation? It was really uncomfortable, but that's real life. And that's why I always say that when men say in cases that I've worked and other colleagues of mine have worked that accidentally the hands were around the neck and in the melee, she must have died and it was all an accident. It just doesn't play out like that. And I just felt they had done their homework. Maybe it had gone on for a little bit longer because she was fighting back. She wasn't incapacitated totally, but it was incredibly uncomfortable you're willing her to live you want her to and so it was just heartbreaking when she didn't that's the bit Umberto couldn't handle he couldn't handle the fact that she died he was really upset by that because he was probably so invested in her yeah it's very traumatic to see that happen but that's the reality of cases like Natalie Connolly Grace Mullane in New Zealand you know when people say it's seconds well it's not just two seconds it, it's minutes he's not got both hands either so he's trying to use his physical mass and you can see the final act the callous disregard he had for her and the final act of the I'm showing you you bitch he didn't say that but his body said that in that final jerk didn't it into her into her head which very well depicted very graphic very traumatic so I can understand why you were traumatized Dean and I think what happened thereafter for me was even more uh, revealing about the callous disregard for her that she wasn't a human anymore no that's right she'd been depersonalized and and you know I guess we can say because we've already spoiled the fact that she's dead so that just that scene just that one scene where Joe the friend of the groom just uses his foot and tucks her hand back into the bonfire I was just sick it's just sickening it's like oh my god it was devastating that, that as i said earlier the film i texted lisa going i made a bad decision in trying to watch this an hour before the show i'm just devastated i don't know what to do i'm still not quite right but laura i was so angry at the filmmaker at that point i had been so on a, an adrenaline high throughout an hour 40 and then i stopped taking notes i was like 
I can't, I can't handle this because I so wanted her to live or have that jump, jump scare where she, she really is alive or Ryan comes and saves the day. I mean, I was completely gobsmacked why they would do that. I really was like, I can't, I can't even cover the show. I can't, it's ruined it for me. But in the t- intervening time, and I've listened to many interviews with Emerald Fennell, that's not what happens when a woman encounters, when she tries violence. This is what happens. She gets women never they win. Don't win yeah. Women will never win, and that's why women, if they are in those situations, they they tend to have a weapon, and they tend to be seen as more callous and premeditated, and they tend to get longer sentences. But I think going back to Dean's point, Joe's reaction to me just said it all. The fact that he so quickly goes into you didn't do anything wrong, and let's get rid of the body. And she's so depersonalized, so dehumanized at that point that I got the sense that these men care nothing for women. And even when Joe, well, we we'll talk about the wedding, but his speech, it just showed me the whole time there was no empathy, no real care, no compassion, nothing towards women. They were just objects, just trophies to be adorned on their arms. And the bro culture was so strong There wasn't even questioning of him, really, of what went on. It was, let's just go into fixing this, disposing of her. And as you said, just putting her body on a fire and then having no, no, they weren't upset. They didn't cry. There was no real trauma. It was just fixing the problem. It was horrific to watch, but they portrayed it very well. And I thought it was so well written, Laura, the scene where Joe comes in and once he discovers that that she's dead... And then the physical interaction between Joe and what's his name again? The, the, Al. the, 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 the Al. Al. It's tender. He's, they're, they're head to head. They're hugging. He even kisses him. Joe kisses him and said, we're going to fix this. It's everything's going to be fine. And I'm just. I was like, wow. It's not your fault. It's not your fault when it so is your fault. There's only one person to blame in there. But, yes, that's the bromance. Staggering. That's the the band of brothers, and that's the bro culture. That's what everyone's up against, the secrets, the the quick to act, the sweeping under the carpet. It never happened. And let's just stick to our narrative. Our narrative will be believed because look at us. We're award winners from our college and our university. We're nice guys. We're upstanding members of our community because we're doctors all these things that go before them but I think they played that out very well but it was very hard I wanted to throw something at my tv so many times because they played those parts so well and apparently I I did read an interview where they were talking about the crew reaction to the filming of the scene of Cassie's murder and apparently the crew were traumatized just as Kerry was saying that they watched the stunt doubles do it first and she actually had to take, she said, I can't, I can't do this yet, right? She was just traumatized watching them. And then the crew were literally watching the monitors through their fingers. They were just horrified. So I guess some, um, you know, we spoke last time, uh, last episode, Lisa, about simulated sex and the trauma that that can bring. And I guess, you know, when, when you're watching someone simulating a murder, I've, I've never worked in the film business as you guys have, but I guess that would be similarly traumatizing. You can very easily imagine it being real. I think it's interesting, Emerald Fennell, her first version of the ending was just going to end with Cassie's body being burned. That was it. And her producers, and I guess the studio say, uh, we have to have at least some kind of ending. And so she came up with this, that Al is going to have to go down for her murder. And that's the only way justice is going to get served, because he's never going to have to pay the price for what he did to Nina. And I think it's very sad that Cassie chose to almost destroy herself rather than have closure, which I know Laura hates that word, um, quote unquote, closure and move beyond to kind of let her friend go. I just thought that was so interesting. I just never, we never see stories like this. So it's interesting that you say the studio discussed with her in her first script didn't have that because that was the one thing. I mean, it, the, the whole movie flip flopped every time you thought it was one thing, it became another. And so that, that Hollywood ending at the end with the police rolling in and on the cruises and arresting, I'm like, wow, that seems really <laughs> okay. I'm up for it. I'm happy with it. I don't mind, but I, I, I could easily understand why she finished it, her original script at the burn scene, because that's the depressing end. It's the depressing reality of the offenders that get away with this sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I still think it's very conflicting. The The fact she doesn't live to see all her work, as Lisa said, that 
she knew that that was probably going to be the most likely outcome. But I think that tape, seeing it, the fact that you see the evidence that what you thought happened, there it is in front of you. You're seeing the people that you suspected it and you're seeing your girlfriend, your who's like your sister, being treated inhumanely and degraded and the, the wall of silence thereafter. And it's like when Madison said, oh, I thought it was funny at the time. The women that enable the behavior, because that happens too. I don't know how anyone could find a video like that funny, but I've always had a very strong moral compass. But it does happen because the bro culture says it's funny, therefore it's funny. And girls go along with that too, because they want to be part of the the cool crowd, the dominant crowd. So I think for Cassie, it just totally threw her over the edge that it was shit or bust. You know, there was no other outcome. But the fact that she had carefully crafted the contingency plan, I thought the timing was a bit too cliched. You know, I always think you send something in the mail, it's delayed, it doesn't get there at the right time. That was a bit too contrived for me. Uh, But I enjoyed the accountability point. I enjoyed the fact that you see these smug bastards being taken down at the moment. You know, and Joe had made his speech about Anastasia saying she's a solid catch, like she's a piece of meat. You've done well. You've got a good woman on your arms because of the way she looks rather than anything of substance that she represents. I wanted these bros going down in a big way. And so I enjoyed seeing that aspect. And the bystander culture, going back to Lisa's point, is their redemption. You know, bystander culture, they tackle in this, which I think is a very important part of this narrative, as well as victim blame and shame and how women play a role and how the ecosystem kicks in. Nina knew, uh, sorry, Cassie knew it wasn't just one or two. It was everybody who played that role in Nina's suicide. And for, I would imagine for Cassie, and as she said, she gave up her medical career to care for her friend. It destroyed her too. So she feels this real sense of getting revenge and avenging her friend. And I think she's a true hero And it didn't play out how any of us probably thought it would. For me, Hollywood is always the cheese on toast. That's what I call it. Cheese on toast with a side of cheese. And I didn't think that this was that ending. And I I enjoyed the reality, the realism of it. And Umberto found that very difficult. He wanted her to be the avenging, you know, heroine. He's not alone. And we're going to wrap right now. But there were fights that broke out apparently in the test screenings about the ending. But Laura, I just wanted to point out to you, I don't know if you you notice this, but because this is a female gaze film, you don't see the rape, right? In another film, she would be looking at the videotape and you would see it happening. You don't see any nudity. This is a movie all about sex and sexual abuse. There's no nudity. There's no violence until the end, until the men execute the violence. And I just thought that that was really interesting. It was because the imagination is far worse. And actually, you imagining what's on the tape, you imagining what she doing to these people, that's classic female lens. I enjoyed every part of it, like the opening with the guys dancing. No female, we're not seeing breasts, we're not seeing bottoms, we're not seeing scantily clad women. And I think the drip, drip, drip of misogyny just being everywhere was very well played out. I think it's going to shock a lot of people, particularly men who watch it. And it always just reminds me of Margaret Atwood's quote, Men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them. That's the reality. So true. So, so true. Well, Laura, I'm so glad that you were able to jump on with us about this. I think that your input on this particular film, I really wanted to you know, hear what you had to say. And so thank you so much for, for joining. You know, I have to say, I was so nervous about you and Jim coming on because it's a lot like like doing your fifth grade report in front of the school and your parents are coming and you really want to get it right. We're all co-hosts so you. together. You shouldn't be nervous. I know. That. We're co-hosts. I know. No, I am nervous. I, I am nervous, but this is sort of, I don't know. Well, I was very happy to come on and certainly happy to talk about